All right, so scientists, some, are sounding the alarm on a so-called solar superstorm that could, and this is important, underline the word could, eventually wipe out the Internet for weeks or even months. The sun is entering a more active time where it tends to flare more often. After those flares, large blobs, for lack of a better word, of plasma enter space and can distort the Earth's magnetic field, the power grid, satellites, navigation and GPS systems and communications equipment are all vulnerable. And we're back. And today we're going to dive a little bit deeper into CMEs, touch on EMPs as well. We're joined by Mike from Switch It Up again. Thanks for coming, Mike. Good to be here. And our in-house master electrician. I always forget the opposite direction when you take the Zoom recording. So it's, it's probably in that corner is probably where you are. And Steve Yost, our master electrician. So y'all are going to have a conversation today a little bit deeper into the details than what we did last time on CMEs and EMPs. I'm sick as a dog. I'm going to do a stage exit left, turn off my mic and my camera, and I'll let y'all take it from here. Awesome. Right, thanks, thank you. Coronal mass ejections are called CMEs, and that is any energy coming off the sun. And what happens is if that just so happens to be coming towards the earth, it reacts with our ionosphere and that's charged particles. It sheds those charged particles towards the earth and very similar to an EMP, how that affects the same charged particles. Uh, for, for the coronal mass ejections, it's a, a much lower frequency. And the issue with that frequency is it acts more like a DC current coupling onto the power lines. The high voltage transmission lines, especially the 200 kilovolt lines and above, Above, greater affected than others and it'll start reacting with the transformers quite a bit to where it'll saturate the cores and cause them to overheat and it just causes mass chaos from there. Uh, some of these transformers are $10 million to replace and if they start getting affected it's major major economic impact right there and of course we've the whole country is covered in these transmission lines, and it's all the way up to 765,000 volt lines that are in certain locations for the longer transmission sections. And as they're adding to the grid, it's it's causing a more and more likelihood that this can affect us. It's not that it's never going to happen. It's just it's it's going to happen more and more likely as time goes on. We've had many, many years over where we've been hit by CMEs. And from the Carrington event in the 1860s, what everybody knows as the big one, and all the way down to um, more recently, you've got actually there's several smaller ones that have hit us throughout the years. But more recently, there's been Quebec in 1989 that's been hit, and that caused a major disruption, too, for about 6 million people. They lost power for, for hours for some, days for others, before they got everything repaired. And it is it is something that's just bound to happen again. As, as well, so, hey, Steve, let me ask you a question. So, do you, what, what X-class flare would be the one that would cause the disruption to the Transformers? Like, I know that we've been hit with x1 x2s i believe even an x3 back in july and it's been consistent as the sun is hitting its its solar maximum phase which uh next year 24 is that 11th year of the solar maximum and and anybody who follows space weather they know that it's really heating up so so do you know what x class would be that one that would affect the transformers in the power grid as, as you're approaching the extreme so you're in the four to five range and i'm not sure what the quebec was classified i know it was oh what was that about 300 pico uh, pico teslas i think it was if i recall right but it was it was up there and i'm not sure what classification that puts it in but it it's substantial <laughs> so so they they had a pretty decent one and whatever class that was is where it starts affecting things greatly their ge's been designing transformers now to try and suppress this and how many are in play i don't know but and and they're trying to add capacitors in series on these lines as well to to kind of quench that dc current because it doesn't pass through the capacitor towards the transformer and it essentially makes a ground loop effect to where it's coupling on the 
power lines coupling in the ground. The neutral line is the one that's really getting affected by this the most. And as that's going into the transformer, it saturates it saturates the core and, and just takes it out. So that 89 uh, solar flare, that one melted down a lot of these transformers and including the power plants too. The, the power plants were greatly affected by this as well. This video is sponsored by William Tell Archery Supplies, home of the Mini Striker crossbow. Click the link in the description below to learn more. The U.S. is supposed to have some potential uh, cell phone and satellite disruption as well as radio disruption today from some flares yes. that that hit over the weekend. And I'm just kind of pulling up some random information here as we're talking. So, this morning, actually, I had cell phone issues, too. There'll be certain days where you'll you'll pick up your phone and you'll notice that the GPS on your phone, your Google GPS may act a little wonky or or the phone seems to just be be loading pages a lot slower than it normally does. That's usually a sign that you got something going on in the atmosphere. And and that being said, too, uh, that it's the satellites that are going to be more affected than anything else because because they're not protected by the Earth's atmosphere. So they, they're they getting the full brunt of that solar flare. Um, it's not reacting with the ionosphere the same, but it does shed some out towards space as well. And they do get that same surge off just the sun's energy alone. And mm -hmm. it is affecting them quite a bit. And that's the probably more important factor. Losing power is one thing, but losing all communication, that's, that's a whole different realm. From GPS alone, I use that often, especially when I'm up in the mountains. I'm a hiker. I rely on GPS almost too much. I still carry a compass just in case, but that's that's another thing that can be affected as well as it'll start making your compass a little wonky as well. Yeah, we've been we've been talking a lot here the past couple of weeks, different circles that I'm involved in and now uh, with Survival Dispatch, uh, Chris, and now meeting yourself. Um, we talk a lot about EM, the potential of an EMP from from a foreign country that doesn't like us and and how that would kind of be centralized to a 600 or 800 square or not square but an 800 mile oh. circle and, yeah. and knock the grid out but the the fact of the matter is uh, i feel we should be talking more about the the cme the coronal mass ejection uh, yes. side of things because you, you type in solar flares and the amount of information like i got a, a link here from cnn CNN is talking this year that the sun's activity is peaking sooner than expected um, with an X1 flare knocking out radio communications in the U.S. back in August. It's the amount of information on this is just very widespread. And I think it's something that a lot of people are curious about, but they they just haven't really wrapped their heads around the big light bulb in the sky being the culprit to, to go and knock things out. But the Internet is the one I want to touch on. We don't even have to we don't even have to lose lose power all together across the grid all all the preppers out there everybody's prepping for an emp or or an invasion or world war three but the fact of the matter is you take the internet out you you'd have an internet armageddon absolutely yes yeah, so th that would be across the board mass chaos right there uh i i see it with the younger generation especially they rely solely on the internet for all their information and i'm guilty of it myself i've got so much data stored online that i really need to make hard copies of and i still haven't but that's all of us Steve. we all i everything's exactly. cloud based for me i run my entire company in the cloud all my banking everything if if the internet went down my my not as not myself alone but everybody our our businesses would cease and desist while we're having this conversation on the yeah. internet we wouldn't be able to do this exactly all the information that you generally get your information from, all, all of it's through the internet. And and it it really is probably the most important backbone to to our society as it is now. And it, it really wouldn't be the greatest effect beyond just mass communication being cut to and not being able to communicate with other people that you're normally talking to would be a huge effect. Do you want premium ad-free content? Duh. Content that's not censored by big tech, of course. But with SD Insider, you can get behind the scenes and a whole lot more. Link in the description. We can't control the internet going down, but it is something no. that, that after uh, talking to Chris before uh, he exited uh, the conversation, that a lot of these grocery stores and distribution chains all rely on this automated system that yeah. sends these orders out. Uh, I think that a conversation like this should be a wake-up call to 
to those CEOs to maintain some kind of old school phone system and yeah. and have a break break open in the case of an emergency. So you can <laughs> so you can still get the food supplies ordered. But since we can't control the internet, being being an electrician, there are ways that we can insulate the grid, right? And they have all of these EMP shields and these shunts and devices that can be yeah. in, retrofitted in transformers. Hopefully they're installing it in all the new transformers as a precaution. But just give me your take on on how we could start insulating the infrastructure. Well, the, the biggest installations are, are going to be the the uh, capacitors that they put in line because typically for home use, you've got MOVs, um, metal oxide varistors, and they got a working range up to about 8,000 volts on some of them. And that doesn't really work with these 200,000 volt lines. And so it's already beyond that capacity. So, so they're putting inline capacitors to help squinch some of that charge going across. And with the uh, transformers, they use CTs on them as well, which are a, a toroidal type transformer that's more affected by these DC currents too, and it will permanently magnetize them. When you're relying on those as your information on what that transformer is doing, and they go to straight zero, all of a sudden you think that transformer is, well, it, it more than likely is dead too, but <laughs> you won't be able to rely on that, that data anymore as far as what that transformer is doing when it is up and operating until you demagnetize this transformer, the CT. And you have to manually do that with, with a demagnetizer. You're saying that after this hits, you got to go and demagnetize the transformer. See, I've been doing, I've been an electrician for 25 years. I've never done the line work, right? So I've never yes. been the guy that does the transformers up on the poles. So this is new information to me. So you're yes, saying- you've worked with the CTs before. So you, you've already seen how they operate and they just couple around the line and it's going to be the same type of just at a bigger scale. If that thing permanently magnetizes, you can't get any data from it anymore. You don't know what that system's doing. And if it's an automated control system, your computer's already making adjustments and causing more power to flow through this thing or trying to trying to adjust this transformer to put out more than zero. So you see in rush and outgoing and, and a zero on the outgoing. This is because this is something that I feel they should be teaching in schools. Like when you go to school to to get your journeyman and then on to your masters, they wow. they never told them they never talked to me about EMPs and CMEs and, and the destructive old. effect it yeah. would have on everything that yes. we're installing. Well really the only scary thing about a CME is not knowing when. I said, it's going to happen, but we don't know when. It could be today, tomorrow, six years down the road, 4,000 years down the road. We just don't know. And yeah, soon... I I feel that there's there's one coming soon that at a minimum is going to continue to disrupt radio communications and cell phone yeah. use. Uh, yeah. As we hit this solar maximum in 2024, the other piece of this that uh, people might not know is there's, there's a comet inbound right now. They're calling it the Devil's Comet because it has like these little horns on it from when it punched through the orc cloud but you got this comet on the way in and whenever and this thing is 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 four times bigger than mount everest so yeah. whenever you have a large body coming in and and facing our sun the sun starts to cmes at it with that yeah. magnetic pole so as this thing's coming in the sun is going to be discharging cmes more so than it normally would yeah which just, my mind goes another is, magnetic force pulling stuff off of it Exactly, exactly. So not only are we hitting a solar maximum where it's going to be doing its thing anyway, you got this, this comet coming in that it's going to be shooting more CMEs than normal. The the sun facing uh, or the earth facing sunspots, that's where you get the that's, CMEs is when you get yep. that black, almost looks like a dim spot in the sun. That's where you get the CMEs break away from those whole looking things in the sun and yes. the earth facing sunspots have just been increasing. So anybody watching, if you don't follow space weather, uh, I suggest you you start out by googling it or or download an app. They got they got the NOA is NOAA. Am I saying NOAA mm -hmm. right? You can download yep. the app where you could actually track space weather and and the warning on these things. If you got the sunspots facing Earth, there's a potential. And when one does rip. I believe the timeline is, what is it, like 12 hours, Steve? You got like 8, uh, eight to 12 it's, hours notice? It, it, it's as soon as 12 hours because it's traveling at about 4 million miles per hour on some of these high speeds. <laughs> but there are slower ones, too, where they take up to a week. And they've got just the same effect 
over a longer duration because it's moving slower now. So it's reacting with the ionosphere that much longer and causing this coupling effect to last longer too. And that's that's what's kind of more dramatic of an effect on this is having that long-term exposure and it's saturating those transformer pores longer and, and the components that they're using to kind of mitigate this are failing. And it's just like these metal oxide varistors on your house that they use for surge protectors. Once that it's it's got a an expiration time to it. So it's it's always degrading. And that's just causing this degradation a lot faster through this long period exposure. And that's really where it's gonna hit the hardest is is these long exposure terms. But Yes, you do have acting ones, which have a lot of energy coming out. We're talking like nuclear bombs going off on the sun, blowing stuff towards us. It's it's that dramatic. It's so much energy being expelled all at once. Well, and what's what's wild is is the aurora borealis, which is mm -hmm. is the effect of of those charged particles hitting yes. the Earth's atmosphere, which. Most people think Aurora Borealis. They think you got to be northern Alaska or North Pole area, but they've been coming as Colorado. They were visible here in Colorado, yes. and and then there's all the talk about about the magnetic poles shifting. And if you look oh, at the man. model, it yeah. it almost like the the magnetic poles coming out of the top and, yeah. and re-entering. They're almost bending downwards and facing yeah, the sun. You see it doing a wobble effect. Yep. And that's that's common. What they say is a common effect just before it does switch. It, it's just yep. like spinning the top. You see it start to do the wobble. And at some point, if you've got a, a certain top, they'll actually flip over and keep spinning the opposite direction too. It's, it's really cool stuff. But um, you have to have a special top to do that. Which is so when you look like at the cool. models that they got, it's almost like the layers of the protect the protective field that we have. It's almost like an onion on the layers, yes. and and if you get hit with a big CME, it actually shows yeah. that layer rips away oh, and goes wow. yeah to the opposite side. And I don't know too much about how it works, but but the models I watch when it flips, it almost looks like it resets those magnetic layers back towards sun facing. Yes, and us being on the northern hemisphere, we don't talk about the southern hemisphere that much but there's also southern lights too when the sun hits those particles down there it's it's letting off the light just the same and they do have the same effects it's not to the same degree so i think your safest zone would be the equator really yeah, which doesn't help us much but no. uh, so we've talked previously about emp shield and how you can you can install the device after your panels between inverters and batteries uh, with all your experience, the EMP shield, is that something that, that will do what it's supposed to do and protect uh, a solar battery inverter uh, combination from a CME? I, the CME is not going to affect the low lines to the same degree. It will do what it's supposed to do for those low level or uh, spikes that you'll get because you're going to have a lot of harmonics affecting these large transformers that initially gets sent downstream so these harmonic waves are going to be disrupting everything else as well and that's what's going to be the initial effect for everything downstream of that and as it's entering your home transformers it's going to cause the same effect because it's just transferring from one side of a magnetic coil to the other side of a magnetic coil almost precisely what it's doing on one side is happening on the other so if you have so if you had the full the full combo right the emp yeah. shield on the um the line side of your panel you mm -hmm. had the emp shield protecting your inverters and your batteries you put it in your rv your cars do you feel that these devices they claim that they can protect against an emp which is the I same know. type of frequency that a cme would cause are you confident that that these devices would protect our our system? So if if the main I, juice goes out, we're we're okay. I have yet to get my hands on a device because I want to personally test test it to my own high voltage standards. So I I run little experiments myself just to see what does hold up and what doesn't. <laughs> I run 10, 20,000 volts through something just a direct spike, just Give a quick a little spike and have some electronic components downstream. Do they survive or don't they? And surprisingly, just a simple surge protector does quench a lot of that to where a lot of times your devices will survive it, but that's for a lower spike and they all have a jewel rating to them. And the, I, I really want to test one of their devices because if 
if I can see that it survives and protects everything downstream, I would definitely put my stamp of approval on that thing saying absolutely, but I've never tested one yet. So I, I can't definitively say yes, it will. So but the, um, the EMP shields um, are, are actually being ordered by the military right now. They're installing correct. vehicles yeah. um, and, and they are, they say that they're tested for actual CME in a controlled yes. environment or not a CME. Yes. They, EMP. They, they claim the third party testing and all that too. And, and but I, I think this would be a good one. Um, I'm I'm really bummed that Chris isn't feeling well. I hope he gets better better as yeah. he can. Uh, but I think we should chat with Chris and 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 get our hands on on a few of these devices. I'd say let's get the whole gamut and and run some some tests and then come back and we can talk again and and videotape some of these tests and then uh for all of the uh, survival dispatch viewers you can actually show them that hey all this stuff this stuff works or it doesn't work there's nothing better than a, a live video test showing showing you throwing some some high voltage down and it does <laughs> and, because and i know myself kind of I, watch too <laughs> just to see uh the the sparks coming off some of this stuff it's pretty fun <laughs> i got i got a generator uh wrap like i always joke around faraday box it's simple it's just an aluminum Absolutely. foil christmas present so i got my i got my nine thousand running watt generator big old school heavy ass thing brand new in the box and i got it double wrapped with aluminum foil so in the event got the floor happens, <laughs> i'll give it a couple of days like chris says if it's an emp oh yeah I'm gonna open it and have it shot again so i'd give it oh, at man. least a week before i pop the sucker open but uh, right now that's all i can i can do is is wrap up the generator put the emp shield between the panels and the inverters and cross my fingers that all their testing actually actually <laughs> paid off but I yeah. yeah, mean, I think we should I think we should try to get our hands on some of those and get them to you and and have you go mad scientist on it. And yes, well, and I just do. love to see the components that they're using as well, just to see how it's laid out, see the how professional they are at designing the circuit board, too, because essentially a circuit board is going to be susceptible to EMP as well. I want to look at that and make sure that this is something that will hold up and see that it's something that's stout for for number one before i even start testing it but i know it, it, talking to emp if this is a nuclear attack that's going to take down the grid even if it's a super emp that that's the only effect it has is just to wipe out electronics that alone wouldn't be the primary attack either they would wait a while have people start rebuilding stuff and then just send another one just take it all out I again mean, it the, the whole weather balloon bullshit that happened and oh, man. from yeah. West Coast to East Coast, in my mind, that was A, surveillance, B, could you get potential. something positioned yes. exactly where you want it? It's, it's that potential. Yeah. The, the nice news about the weather balloon is it's not a high enough altitude to really couple well with the ionosphere. So you need that up a little higher, but it, it, it is a definite way to deliver some crazy stuff that nobody wants around us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But so being electricians, the big thing that I was talking to Chris about last time I was on was anybody prepping. This is something, this is a prepper tool that should be considered to be put in the prepper toolbox. If, yes. if you got solar panels, you got inverters, you got batteries for a few hundred bucks, you got these devices. And the way I always joke, I say, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. If you got the U.S. military actively purchasing these devices and yes. installing, that means they're concerned. Do as the Romans do. Do as do as the military yes. does. And if you you can get your hands on this stuff as a as a uh, civilian consumer, uh, I'm all about it. And military usage of it is a pretty good stamp of approval. When you see military using stuff, that means they've tested it. They've got confidence behind it as well. And that that alone is is worth its weight in gold right there. And I would be more confident knowing, okay, this is something the military uses. Let's go ahead and try that too. And, you know, hope for the best. But in energy, um, energy um solar company they they offer it as a add-on add to, on, their, yeah, to their exactly. services um, i caught wind of it and i'm like i i want that like i'm gonna i'm gonna lean heavily that these guys are doing the testing they say they're gonna do and then like you the military is doing it i'm gonna feel confident that this yeah. thing is gonna do what it's supposed to do but at the end of the day, unless more people are made aware of the potential of a CME, and, and I always yes. say, don't forget about the EMP, but the more likely event is going to be a CME, coronal mass ejection from the sun. The more people in the community, in the survival dispatch community that are prepared, the faster we're going to be able to, to put things back together. So 
That's why I love having these conversations is, is you just, and pun intended, right? Just bing, make the light bulb go well, off over your head. And, and just bouncing the ideas off too. And that's, that's the biggest thing is, is getting this conversation going. But as far as a personal level, your household level, what you're going to experience the most is, hey, we've got no power. And this could be a long term because some of, like I said, some of these transformers are huge. They're $10 million a piece to replace. And you're talking trillions of dollars to replace them all. So if we have a nationwide effect, which of course the Northern region and actually Northeastern region, if you look at the maps of it, how it, how it goes across our state country here it's a lot of canada and a lot of us but it's that northeastern range all the way almost down to florida and that's your greatest band of effect and it's going right across my hometown as well but as it's going closer and closer to the equator it's it's being dropped off considerably because of the direction yeah direction of the earth and how it's going to hit the earth but well, I just I just found out from a buddy of mine who's uh he's a huge Elon fan, so he's got the oh, yeah. Tesla and he's got the Starlink set up. That the the Starlink system and the Tesla vehicles all have built in EMP and and CME protection on yes. the vehicles, which is really cool. So that right there is it, it's for me it's a little bit of a comfort factor knowing that these Absolutely. these techie guys, Elon being like the biggest techie guy I could I could name, right? He's yeah. already forward thinking and implementing this into the satellites, into the systems here on Earth, as well as his vehicle. So so these guys are obviously forward thinking that. Yeah, and that's that's what you start seeing is across the board, more and more people concerned about it. And you start to wonder why. Okay, well, let's look at why. And for all you viewers out there, just do a quick internet search and see how often these CMEs are actually hitting the Earth and at a greater effect you start lining up these years that it's hitting and it's becoming a little more frequent as well but um, unfortunately for the the data points back to the carrington effect you you don't they've got an estimation of what that was they know what the 1989 was but beyond that it's it's kind of guesstimating what happened years ago and had it not been for our telegraph lines we probably wouldn't have known what was happening during that 1890s stuff. Exactly, it, it, exactly. Uh, you kind of, uh, just before I forget, so a point, and, and, and I did this myself, is um, we all have, we all have our, our, our rifles, we all have our ammunition, but I know for myself on my AR, I have a nice digital scope that's got batteries and it's a, it's a really dope red dot. Good to go. <laughs> but an EMP or a CME, oh, it, 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 yeah. it could kill the electronics or the battery. The EMP this thing. will. Yep. The yep. EMP. And if you will. don't, if if you haven't practiced much on your iron sights and, and you're dependent on that red dot, you're going to be out of commission. So another thing that I would suggest to survival dispatch, a lot of these guys know this, but those that don't, you should have one in a box wrapped in aluminum foil with a brand new Absolutely. set of batteries wrapped in aluminum foil. And, well, not and, the batteries. <laughs> Insulate them first, please. <laughs> yes. No. You're well yeah, in a box, brand new. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to make contact that'll burn up, and your yeah, your whole pack will go to shit. But no, brand new batteries wrapped up in the box and aluminum foil, double aluminum foil, created or, or a Faraday bag. Uh, Chris ha- had a video with his wife popping out of the biggest Faraday bag that I've ever seen in my life. Hey guys, today's video is brought to you by Off Grid Trek. This is a huge Faraday bag. It's the biggest one we've ever seen at Survival Dispatch with 126 liter capacity to protect all your gear from that EMP. Is it here yet? <laughs> what? The EMP. I heard there's another Chinese spy balloon coming. Oh, geez. You have these. Uh, electronic scopes and range finders, night vision, things of those nature, um, you're going to want to have backup stored in a Faraday bag because in the event of an EMP or CME, you're going to lose those electronics. Yeah. Luckily for me, I, I built a new house, so I had the opportunity to to design some features in here. And, and I actually built in a Faraday room. So the entire room is wrapped. And that's just stage one is the Faraday room. And that'll have a good 40 decibel attenuation to it. And then everything in the room is also rewrapped again. You couldn't just go with that old school. I don't know if you remember back during the Cold War, all the insulation you would buy would have that aluminum face yes. that you would put in the wall. And it would literally almost create that Faraday box in your house as much as possible, obviously, other than the windows and the doors. 
But yeah. what did you do to get that decibel rating in the room? Did you just go aluminum sheet or what? Aluminum sheet, taped seams. Everything has to be taped seams, overlaps. And that is the exterior. Then it's concrete construction and it's about a foot thick concrete. And then aluminum wrap on the inside as well. Now, the aluminum wrap on the inside is a perforated aluminum for for moisture so that way you're not trapping the moisture in in the wall but so that way it's got a way to escape but that's also a way for some signal to get through at the frequency that emps hit your whole size has to be about 0.3 millimeter to to stop that waveform so it's one tenth of the size of the wave when you're working with a hundred megahertz or sorry 100 gigahertz wave uh, the wavelength is three millimeters 2.9 millimeters. So your whole size has to be one tenth of that to stop that waveform. So you're allowed a two point, uh, sorry, a 0.29 millimeter whole size. See, for and all the viewers, for well. all the viewers here that don't know that detail, this is something where I would love to talk to Chris if if you could put this on a on a word document, just give some basics that you could then put out there. The baseline is sealed completely sealed that's that's it you've got a uniform structure completely sealed and that's what you're after uh, essentially if it holds water it, it'll hold out the emp but uh, it's got to be a conductive material aluminum is really good conductor copper is even better so a copper coat of some sort would be a better attenuator than what aluminum is okay and you also have to keep in mind that aluminum oxidizes as well so you've got to get those seams covered up pretty soon too yep yep how, how did you how did you seal your door i've got copper strips all the way around the door so i've got a copper it's kind of like that two inch it looks like duct tape but it's it's copper just a pure copper coat i've got that and i folded it over on itself to act like a feather against the door and then the door has a seal all the way around the perimeter and it's a steel door too so i've got it sealed all the way around that perimeter and then another one around the base of the perimeter too so so that's just the opening side of it on the door itself and then around the door as well has on another the inside seal. you're kind of double on the inside of the frame yes so so let me, so add, let me ask steel. you your average gun safe uh made of steel pretty good yeah. would that would that stop the wavelength it, from getting in or is that gap around that gap is where it's coming through so, so, you'll so somebody see, could use their gun safe and if they did a little mod they could essentially yeah, you'd have to remove the paint around both the door and the frame and just put aluminum tape all the way around it and you want to make sure that if you've got a voltmeter, put it on ohms, put it on the outside of the tape and scrape off some paint towards the base of the safe too, and put it there and make sure you've got continuity between the foil tape and the door, because sometimes the adhesives of that tape, if they're not conductive, it's got to be a special type of tape. Got so you've it. got to so test it out, make, make sure, sure that you're the actually sealed. Yep, make sure you're actually making conduction between the two sides. Well, no, and this is, I love you're a, just a wealth of information, Steve. I'm really glad that uh, Chris was able to, to put this together. You're, you just, you got all of this stuff up here. Dry. So now we're talking about safe. So this is a little a debate that I've had with people at, at Cabela's and, and uh, Murdoch's and Bass Pro. And I asked the question that, because all the, I'm a, I'm a fan of the old school turn mechanical Same. dial safe. Yep. And I asked the guy the question, with this digital lock, in my mind, if there's an EMP or a significant CME, I ain't going to be able to get into my safe. It's going to smoke my digital Great. lock. And then everything that I've been prepping and saving for is behind that digital lock. I'm fucked. That's right. Now he's got to blur that out. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. So, no, Chris. <laughs> but so, you're right. You're right. Uh, all these digital locks, they're going to be down and out with an EMP. For a CME, they should survive it. But for EMPs, they're definitely not. But it, it depends on what you've got blocking that. EMP pulse from reaching it is what's important then. So you so, could build your own little tape housing around the lock, uh, scrape the paint around this thing and have it a single conductive path all the way around this lock to where it's not going to be bombarded with those signals. Hey, we need that, that or I don't know if that whole digital piece can come off because it has a cord, right? If it you does. Back up a spare one. A spare, <laughs> a spare one of those wrapped in don't a lock it in your thing. And, <laughs> and don't keep it in the safe, have it stashed yeah. somewhere else. But that's, yeah. I, I even asked the guy, I said, so in the event of an EMP or a CME, 
is am I going to be able to get in here? And they said, oh, yeah, these locks are EMP proof. And I'm like, I, They're not. I don't know about that. No, uh, you, you pull that pad off and you look at the backside, you can see the electronics right there. There's no, I, I haven't seen any metal oxide bristers on them, nothing. I, it's, I just look at this thing and it's a basic circuit board. There's no protection on that that I've seen yet. And of course, there's going to be different manufacturers beyond the one that I looked at. So there might be a few out there that do have some suppression on them. But as far as what I've seen, they're relying on just that battery to. I, I can tell that. you, I can tell you that that there's there's a lot of uh, uh, survival dispatch audience right now that is like. Oh, oh shit. no! <laughs> I didn't even think of that. All of my stuff that I want in the event of something going down, I'm not going to be able to get to it. Yeah. So, so hopefully the that these, the beauty of that pad is quick access. So you you punch in your code real fast, and I'm still sitting at my dial spinning four times. You're already in your safe. I'm just getting prepped to put in my code. <laughs> I'm a I'm a big fan of the old school mechanical. You there's nothing Same. that you you can do whatever you want to it. You don't have to worry about the batteries dying. But that's the, right. This is is we can't find them anymore. You have to special order a lot of them. So what would so other than I don't know if you can get a backup keypad that has the combination to open. I don't know. Yes, that, that would be a good question is whether or not the keypads are interchangeable one for another and everything that's inside is stored or if it's the keypad itself that's the main brains of this thing. I, I know I, I know that it. we just we just flipped a lot of these these fellow yeah. members on their head. They're like, wait a minute, I wasn't even thinking no, about we were it. talking about CMEs over here. <laughs> but it's all it's all intertwined, right? We we it all is. we all have our our food, mm -hmm. our our ammunition and and our yep. weapons in the event that we need them. And I know that that I have a digital safe and my yes. stuff is behind it. And other than other than hacking at the thing with a, a little saw trying to get in there, yep. it would it would be very cumbersome to that's, not be well, able to access. That's the nice thing about a lot of the gun safes is the back, the sides, they're usually a thinner gauge steel. So it's usually around 10 gauge, 11 gauge steel that they're forming the housing around so it's the door that's the thick part but you cut through the side you can get into that thing within an hour always i always laughed at that i'm like because yes. anybody obviously you know this you make the door six inches thick but then the sidewall is just a little yeah. deal yeah that's the why only... when, when i build my dream house i'm gonna have the safe set into a concrete box yeah. so then you can't then you can't and get build, in and build that at your faraday cage yeah, exactly <laughs> But no, yep. man, this is this is really good information, and and it seems to me that the EMP talk and and the CME talk has been widespread lately, where yes. where people are starting to realize the the different things that we need to talk about and, and prep for. So, well, the biggest thing is you're seeing more and more people waking up to, hey, the military's doing this. Hey, people like Elon are doing this. Hey, you've got Bill Gates prepping. What's what's going on? Why why are more and more of these wealthy or elites or whatever you want to call them? Why are more of them focused on this as being a potential within their lifetime? Because that's what you're looking at is Bill Gates isn't a young guy anymore. So he's he's prepping. It's going to happen within his lifetime. So you start seeing that and you're, you, you wonder, OK, well, what's going on that that these guys are worried about it because they might be attuned to more information than what we have. I think that uh, uh, we should definitely revisit this. And on my end, I know that what I'm going to do for the audience, and I'm sure that they'll do for themselves as well, but I'm going to see, is this digital keypad I have, are you able to purchase one from a manufacturer that will have the code stored where you just unplug your deal, plug yeah. the other one in, and it would work the same. So I want to figure that out. I want to reiterate what you said earlier, how you can retrofit and mod your your gun safe with that tape that you're talking about to seal the door that would then protect your your sights and your electronic sights, red dots, night vision, thermal scopes, whatever you got behind the door, which I really yeah. like that. So I'm going to jump on and that. If you're, if you're using the tapes too, look at the copper tapes because they've got a different adhesive. So it is a more conductive material to start with. And it's not an adhesive that blocks the electrical flow through it. So you've got a better conduction to your base material. And keep in mind, you got to scrape that paint too. Yeah, that's the big one. So you to scrape the paint. So this is all really good information for everybody on Survival Dispatch. So I know that that's something I'm going to jump on immediately. But next time we talk, I'm hoping that we can, we can uh, talk to Chris and get 
one of each, the, the panel, the solar, um, the RV and the car EMP shield, yes. if we could get those in your hands. And over the next couple months, um, maybe you could do some videos of you, like I said, going mad scientist on it and and showing everybody like, hey, thumbs up. This stuff does yeah. what it's supposed to do. I'd love to get my hands on that. I know one thing we didn't cover yet either was the heating effect of the CME as well. So anything that's conductive will actually increase heat substantially. Um, you'll you'll start seeing metal gutters out on your house where they're, they're going to have... Um, Oh, what's that called? Uh, St. Elmo's fire. They've got another term for it, but it's St. Elmo's fire where it starts glowing off the corners and peaks of the gutters too, as it's building this charge. Yeah, but just the, the, it literally starts to heat the entire. Yep. Everything yeah. starts heating up and, and with a major coronal mass ejection, I'm not sure if that would be a heating effect to the point of igniting fires off that stuff as well. But luckily gutters, it's a short path where power lines, you've got miles and miles and miles of them. And that's where you start getting the heating effect at a greater effect well, there. The Carrington, the Carrington event, that's the yeah. telegraph lines literally melted, melted. and yep. fell off of the poles and the starting fires off that the little tick things in the offices yep. literally burst into flames. So, and, and those wires were un, uninsulated. Just like mm -hmm. all of our high transmission lines, it's literally all just bare wire. Unexplained. Yep, just bare wire hanging up there. So no, this is a really good conversation piece, and 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 as everybody's watching, obviously, I love the comments. How do we start to talk? A, we do it at the at the consumer level, but yes. but being being a, an electrician and someone who deals with this on a large commercial scale, businesses need to start to find ways to insulate themselves, and and these distribution centers, uh, if they're not putting CME and EMP protection built into every single transformer that's rolling off the production line right now, that's something wrong. Like we, I know. we should be doing it. Well, and that's the thing is they're not going to replace what's already working. So they, they wait for a failure before they replace it. So even though G's coming up with these things, they're not just taking out the old one and putting in the new one at a $10 million hit. They're going to wait for that $10 million transformer to finally take a dump before they put that thing in. Well, what so, we, so this, I got a question for you. So these new transfer, a lot of the new stuff that goes in, everything's underground, right? I love it because uh, being yeah. born in Boston, everything is above ground. You get ice storms would come in and mm -hmm. friggin' wreak havoc. We'd lose power for days at a time. But these newer transformers, like the green boxes that, that yep. you see everywhere and everything's underground. Is that stuff, and most of those lines, all those lines are insulated and usually in some conduit. Uh, yeah, that's are those lines side. better protected? Well, the lower volt side of it is going to be better protected, and you don't have the same effects as what's happening on the high volt side. And that's that's what you're really looking at is anything above the 200,000 volts, those transmission lines are not only longer to, to couple that, but they're more susceptible because of their higher energy. And that's what's when that core goes saturated you're starting to get these huge amperage spikes throughout that thing, causing it to melt down in that transformer. That's that's where it's really hitting them harder is that 200 volt and, or 200,000 volt and above is, is all that system. And that's across the country. Like if you start looking at the map of the 200,000 volt and above lines, you'll see them spider webbed all over the country. And that's what's going to be hit the hardest and there's probably a good 300 or more transformers on those lines that will be affected and, and that's that's your that's your main distribution to everything else so you take those out and everything else is gone downstream i'm a homeland security major and i remember when i started diving into the meat and potatoes of of right. events that could happen like this the first thing we learned from a from a terrorist standpoint was the power grid of this country it's it's the glass jaw of the U.S. It is. First world country with a third world power grid. And hopefully everybody at the top making the decisions, they're talking about this in the inner circles and they're starting to make some preparations on how we can we can insulate the infrastructure yeah. as much as possible. Yeah, and and their main attack is to put inline capacitors. So that's what they're doing right now is putting inline capacitors on these power lines and to try and take up that voltage spike that's coming down. And that's that's what's happening now. Hopefully, as they're rolling these programs out and and hardening these lines to some degree, it'll have less and less effect. But it's it's hard to convince companies to put a ten million dollar 
transformer on the shelf just in case. Uh, it's not something that a whole lot of, because these are technically private power companies. So they're monopolies, but they're private power companies. And to tell them, hey, you need to put a $10 million transformer on your shelf just in case this one goes out, they're, they're going to say, no, no, I don't think we are. We'll order one if it happens. <laughs> and <laughs> not thinking that, well, you're not going to be able to. Uh, it's exactly, yeah, exactly. You're not going to be able to. Exactly. But that's, that's the minor concern for them. But of course, they don't want to go with power disruptions for any length of time because that's a direct effect on the net profit as well. And that's that's their focus. That's, that's why you see the trucks rolling out so fast as soon as you have a, a tree coming down on the line is they want to get that power back up and running so they can keep charging you for your service. Exactly. And, but uh, so just to touch one more time, so there's, sure. there's all these articles. If you dive down the rabbit hole and you actually start to to do some research on on CFDs yeah. and solar flares, there's articles that have been being put out since November. There's one here from November 14th of 23 that next year the solar storms are going to increase so much that the big talk in the solar weather community is the internet being knocked out for months. They're saying that the there's, they're not worried about the power as yeah, much as they are. They're worried about communication. About the communication, about the internet. And they're yeah. right, internet apocalypse. They're going over uh, how it is a potential. And, and these communities are talking about it. They're saying that 2024 is going to be the peak when the sun starts peaking. And from 2024 to 2028, the sun is going to be super active. And there's all of this talk that X flares, the most powerful classification of solar flares, Yes. are are heating up and have the potential to knock the internet out for months. You know, right right now we're coming out of a grand solar minimum. We're starting on the upward cycle again. So it's an 11 year cycle and as we're coming out of this grand solar minimum, you're going to see a lot more of these spiking off too. So so what I and this would be a plug for Elon is if if he's in fact insulating his Starlink internet yeah, system he could be the only thing up and Starlink running. I think I think I may invest in a Starlink phone and some Starlink internet. So if anything happens, I'm still connected. And I'm kind of curious to what level he's hardened these. I'm not sure because no. It, and again, that's I'm gonna I got I got some some notes here. I'm gonna do some research on okay. on the Starlink systems. How insulated are they? I'm also gonna do some research on the keypad if that's interchangeable. And yes. then hopefully uh, uh, after the holidays we can have another conversation. And by then maybe you've You've shot 20,000, 30,000 volts through some of these EMP shields yeah. and, and you can come back as your own private consumer testing and say, we're good to go. Good to go. I'd like that. But yeah, yep. but yeah, man, this has been fun. Uh, bummed that, oh, yeah. that Chris wasn't here. Hopefully. Yeah, we don't need him. <laughs> <laughs> it's, no, it's, hey, you know, we, we, we dove down the rabbit hole and I think we stayed pretty much yes. on track. We'll, we'll let Chris dive in and tell us how we did, but okay. uh, all the survival dispatch community out there, uh, Start to put some thought behind those electronic keypads on your safes and and at a minimum, get the paint off of the edges and get that copper yes. tape. In. Good conduction. That's what you're after is a good conduction between the two faces, the, between the door and the frame is what you're trying to get a path going across. So that way you've got a continuous shield all the way around. Really, really good information, Steve. You're just a wealth of knowledge, man. I'm hoping uh, I get to see you face to face here. There's a lot of events going on with um, Survivor Man, uh, Aftermath. I don't know if you're going to be involved in any of that. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. It would be fun to see you over there. So, but we've we've been off for a while. So let's talk again soon. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Appreciate your see time. See you later. Become a Survival Dispatch Insider. We bring together survival enthusiasts and preppers to share knowledge and skills, which means you can enhance your preparedness for emergencies and ensure the safety of your community. The results you'll get? Improve your emergency preparedness by learning skills and strategies from experienced preppers. Build lasting connections with like-minded individuals to share your passion for safety and readiness. Access a wealth of knowledge and resources to assist you in protecting you and your community in certain situations. Go to survivaldispatch.com to get started.